God bless you. Please be seated. We have been studying from the book of Revelation. And today we are in Revelation chapter 19. I am reading to you from verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great all, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. And has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four bees, living creatures, fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard a sweet word, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And it says unto me, Right. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says unto me, These are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Those are the words we're looking at today. For the benefit of the young people who have just come to know the Lord. When you read a passage of scripture, you ask yourself a number of questions. Number one, who? Who wrote it? Who? To, to whom was this written? What? What is this describing? How? How will it be fulfilled? Where? Where will it take place? When? When will these events actually take place? As to well ask the questions, who? To whom? Where? What? And you want to know when? Then you go through that passage again and it will help you to understand the details of the passage. Open your Bible to that verse 1. After these things I heard. That means John the beloved had heard many, many things and he had seen many, many things. And then he said, after these things, after all the things I saw, after all the things I heard, then I heard another thing again. How you two can say, after these things, after the crusade, there is still more. You see, there are many people that attend the crusade, and after these things, for them there is a full stop. But you see, in the word of God, after these things, there is more. After these things, there is more. After these things, there is still what you are going to hear. And there is still what you are going to see. That's why we brought you here. That with all that you have seen, with all that you have heard, you'll be able to say, after these things, I heard. In the case of John, what did he hear? Verse 1. 
I had a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. In the case of John, when he said after these things, 19 comes after 18. After what I saw in 18, I now saw another scene in chapter 19. What did he see in chapter 18? He saw the judgment of Babylon. The apostle John beheld the joy, the jubilation, the celebration of the bridegroom of the Lamb. And he also saw the joy and the celebration of the bride of the church. The sigh and the shout of woe had been suspended and the song and the shout of wedding now is taking place. The stage is set for the long-awaited celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the righteous on earth now become the residents of heaven. And because of that, we hear Hallelujah. It tells us, it said, there's a great voice, a great voice of much people in heaven. And a great voice of much people in heaven said, Hallelujah. Not watch, Hallelujah. Many, many people use that word almost every worship time. What does it mean? Actually, the word Hallelujah is an Hebrew word. And it is used very much in the Psalms. Because you see the Psalms tell us to sing to the Lord. And to praise the Lord. And actually that word hallelujah is a compound word. A compound word is a word that is made up of different words joined together. And you break that word hallelujah into three parts. Hallel. Then U. Then Yah. Hallel means praise. You means you. And Yah means the Lord. And so when you put all that together, whenever you hear hallelujah, it means praise ye the Lord. Do you understand now why anytime a preacher comes, anytime the evangelist comes, and from the pulpit here, I say hallelujah. Then you say praise the Lord. Because they actually mean the same thing. And whenever you hear that, you're hearing praise the Lord. I told you that he first appeared in the Psalms. And what the Psalms have done is that they have interpreted it for us. Let's look at some of those verses of scripture in Psalm 106. Psalm 106 verse 48. You'll see it in verse 48. It says... Blessed be the name of God, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Those four letters ending that verse simply means, Hallelujah. That's how the God praise ye the Lord. And then is Psalm 111. Psalm 111, reading from verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. That's that word. Hallelujah. It has been translated into English there. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great. Sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. That's that thing again there. Praising the Lord. And it just means, hallelujah. Psalm 113. In Psalm 113 verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. That's the word again. That's hallelujah translated into English. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And then in verse 9, it says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. And it ends up by saying, Praise ye the Lord. That is because he blesses the barren with children. Then you say, Hallelujah. Because he heals the sick, you say, Hallelujah. Because he delivers the oppressed, you say, Hallelujah. And because he has satisfied and met our need, you say, Hallelujah. Psalm 146 verse 1. In Psalm 146 verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. That's the word again. That's hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Why? Look at verse 8. The Lord 
openest the eyes of the blind. That's why we say hallelujah. The Lord raises them that are bowed down. That's why we say hallelujah. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. And even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations, praise ye the Lord. Psalm 148 verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. In verse 13, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and the heaven. He also exalts the horn of his people. Praise the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. And it's in the Psalms you have that word, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, so many times. As you come to the New Testament, the word hallelujah appears in the New Testament only four times. And only in the book of Revelation. And only in this chapter we're looking at Revelation chapter 19. Yes, they praise the Lord in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes, they praise the Lord in the Acts of the Apostles. And Paul, the apostle writing to the believers, how many times he said, I give thanks to God, I praise the Lord. But the word, hallelujah, as it appears in the Old Testament, praise ye the Lord, used only four times in the New Testament. And those four times you'll find in Revelation chapter 19. The question is this. In Revelation chapter 19, what do we see? As for the praise of the Lord, number one, we see the context of praise. Number two, we see the causes, the reasons of praise. Number three, we see the content of praise. And then number four, we see the congregation that praise the Lord. And then number five, we see the commandment to praise. Number one is the context of praise. What's the context of the praise here? I want you to look back again in Revelation chapter 19 verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. That means praise ye the Lord for salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Why? Because for true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great all which did corrupt the earth for fornication, with a fornication, and has avenged the blood of his servants at our hand. He tells us here the reason. Why the people of God at that marriage supper of the Lamb, why they will praise the Lord is because of the judgment of Babylon. Because of the judgment of the evil doers. Isn't that always the case? Whenever evil doers are judged, the people of God, they shout the praise of God. Can I remind you, the children of Israel had been in captivity for many years. And then one day, the Lord delivered them. And Pharaoh and his chariots and his people decided, why did we let them go? We're going to pursue them. And then we're going to bring them back into captivity. And then the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And the Lord delivered them. After that deliverance and the enemies perished in the Red Sea. What did they do? They praised the Lord. That's always what happens when God judges Satan. When God conquers the evil spirits that have been tormenting you. And when God brings to naught the power of your persecutor. You are going to praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 15. I am reading from verse 1. Exodus 15 verse 1. Then sang Moses. And the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake saying. I will sing unto the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider as sea thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. 
and he is become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God. I will exalt him. In verse 7, in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest for thy wind, thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. The context of praise. And the reason you are praising the Lord is because the Lord has broken your yoke. And the Lord has destroyed all your fetters. And the works of the devil in your life, they have been brought to naught. And because of that deliverance and because of the judgment of the enemy, that's why they praise God. Number two, the causes of praise. The causes of praise. And the reason is because rebellion is over. And justice is meted out. And full salvation deliverance has come. God is honored and the bride of the Lamb is ready. And that's the reason for the praise. That's the cause for the joy. That's the reason and the cause for the celebration of the people of God. The causes of praise. Rebellion is over and justice is meted out. I want to show you the example in Judges chapter 5. In Judges chapter 5, that's what you always find. I'm reading verses 1 and 2. Judges chapter 5 verse 1 then sang Deborah and Barak the son of Abinoam on that day saying praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves and then in verse 13 then he made him that Remainers have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. That's the reason we're rejoicing. That's the reason we're praising the Lord. That's the reason we're glorifying him. Because rebellion is over and the enemy is conquered. Number three, the content of the praise. As we come back to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, I see the content of praise. What were they saying when they praised the Lord? This is what they said. They said in verse, in verse 1, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Anytime you are praising the Lord, you're not giving honor to yourself. You're not glorifying yourself. You're giving glory to God. You're giving honor to God. You're giving praise to the name of the Lord. Revelation chapter 5 verse 12. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 12, you see that same content of praise. And anytime you want to praise the Lord, that's what you need to understand. You're praising the Lord. This is what you need to understand. Revelation chapter 5 verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. That was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And I just tell you something when you are praising the Lord. Anytime you come out to give praise to the Lord, you're giving your testimony. A, B, C, A, audible. Whenever you are praising the Lord, let's hear what you are saying. Make it audible. B, brief. Not too long. Other people want to praise the Lord to you. We have a mighty host. And we have many, many people wanting to praise the Lord. A, audible. B, brief. C, Christ-centered. You don't praise man. You don't praise preachers. You don't praise anybody. Neither do you exalt yourself. Your praise, your glory to God must be Christ-centered. Now, the congregation of praise. That is the people that praised the Lord. They were the redeemed, the resident saints in heaven, the angelic hosts. And you now, if you are born again, then you are going to join them. You too, you are going to be able to say, I'm praising the Lord because of what he has done. Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, we're looking at verse 9. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After this, I beheld, lo, a great multitude. I pray you'll be part of this great multitude. 
which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms of victory in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God who seated upon the throne and unto the lamb and all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worship God saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever and everybody said amen and then the command to praise and you look at Revelation chapter 19 verse 5 verse 5 and a voice came out of the throne saying praise our God all ye his servants and ye that fear him both small and great the command to praise who are the people who are commanded to praise all who fear the Lord all who know the Lord all who are the children of God the sons and the daughters of God and the servants of God the servants of God they are also to praise the Lord have you noticed sometimes when God has done a great miracle and maybe the miracle is done in the family of maybe a pastor, a leader an evangelist, a coordinator and all the others are coming to praise the Lord, they don't come to praise the Lord because they say I am a servant of God, I am a leader in the church, yes all are to praise the Lord, praise our God all ye his servants and then all ye that fear the Lord both small and great we're going to praise the Lord I divide the study today to three parts number one the reasons for the majestic song reasons for the majestic song number two readiness for the marriage supper and then number three the righteousness of multitude of saints let's come back to number one reasons for the majestic song and let's come back to Revelation chapter 19 and I'm reading to you from verse 1 and after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying hallelujah salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God for true and righteous are his judgments for he has judged the great all the mother of fornication Halotry, abomination, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And a smoke rose up, that is the smoke of the great all, the smoke of the mother of abominations. A smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders representing the church raptured and in heaven. And the four beasts, the four living creatures representing the angelic host, fell down and worshipped God. That means there's going to be a combination of angelic as well as human praise and worship. They'll worship God that sat or that sits on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him both small and great and I heard a seat were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth as you look at uh, that passage you'll see that there are four major reasons why there was a mighty shout of Alleluia the mighty shout of praising the Lord number one because of the salvation of God he has saved us Number two, because of the severity of God, his severe judgment had come upon Babylon. Number three, because of the sovereignty of God, his sovereign, his king, his lord, and nobody can effectively, successfully resist his power. Number four, because of the supremacy of God. He's supreme, he's the most high, and he's highly exalted. And because he takes unto him his own authority and power, that's the reason why the hosts of heaven are praising the Lord. The love of God, 
the grace of God, the power of God, planned, provided, and effected salvation. The salvation of all who believe in Christ. Our salvation, salvation today, salvation continually, fi salvation finally, full and final salvation. It's of the Lord, so he deserves our praise. The resident saints of God in heaven also praise him because of the severity of his judgment on wicked Babylon and on all unrepentant sinners in all generations of the world. When the iniquity of sinners, when the rebellion of rebels, when the apostasy of apostates, when all those things are judged, there is a jubilant singing, rejoicing, hallelujah, which will ring in the courts of heaven. When all Christ rejecting men are finally judged, and the final apostasy of evil is destroyed, all heaven will express the joy of the triumph of glory and power of God. The next hallelujah comes with an amen. If you look at that in a verse, uh, you look at verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and they worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. It's just saying, Amen. It's confirmed. That's what Amen. That appears in the Bible in a number of times. So Old and New Testament simply means affirm. We affirm it. Amen. God has done it. Amen. God has accomplished what he said. Amen. Nobody can prove God to be a liar. He said so. He has done it. We affirm it. We ratify it. We confirm it. Amen. It's a word of affirmation. It's a word of confirmation. And it's a word of sacred ratification. That's the word that seals and affirms the promise of God and the prophecy of God and the power of God. The final hallelujah comes and announces that God omnipotent reigneth. His sovereignty is without question. His supremacy cannot be denied. And because of that, we worship. Because of that, we praise. Because of that, we submit. Because of that, we adore. And then he tells both the small and the great to worship and adore him. As we look at this, let's see some references of the Bible. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I had a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. When God eventually, when God finally, when God ultimately, when God in his supreme way triumphs over evil and over the evil one and over the devil that had deceived many in the world and destroyed many in the world. When God eventually triumphs over the devil and over all evil, there will be a shout of praise in heaven. That's the reason for the majestic song that we have seen. And let's see chapter 7 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 10. The reasons for that glorious song. For that majestic song. The reason why the hallelujah reigns the courts of heaven. Revelation chapter 7. Reading from verse 10. And cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb and all the angels stood round about the throne and about round about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying Amen blessing glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever and everybody said 
And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that seated on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more. Neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. And shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. We we'll pray that that time will come speedily. When God shall wipe away all tears from the eyes of his people. In Revelation chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 5. Revelation 16, verse 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast thus judged you see the people of God you see the hosts of heaven praising God because he had judged judged Satan judged the followers of Satan and judged the doers of evil and here we're told about the characteristics and the attributes of God that he is which art and was in the past and shall be in the future is the one that is today is the one that had been before and is the one that is still to come he lives forever from everlasting to everlasting in verse 6 for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I had another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. We come to the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 1. In Malachi chapter 1, reading there from verses 4 and 5. Malachi chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 Whereas Edom says we are impoverished but we will return and build the desolate places thus says the Lord of hosts they shall build but I will throw down the Lord is telling us here is final authority that the wicked cannot just say, I will do whatever I want, any time I want to do it, in any place I want to do it, and to whosoever I want to do it. And that's why the children of God are praising the Lord, because wicked people do not have the final authority. They may propose, but it is God who disposes. They may decide, but it is God himself who defines the path of man that's why over here it says although Edom is saying we will return and we will build the desolate places thus says the Lord of hosts they shall build but I will throw down and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever and your eyes shall see and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. That tells us then, whatever wicked people propose or whatever they plan, it is the word of God that will be final. And because we realize that, that's why we are praising the Lord, shouting to the Lord, glory be to your name, honor be to your name. Because you have taken your great authority and power 
and not Satan, nor the followers of Satan can contradict or resist or reverse whatever you decide to do. In Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4 from verse 8. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 and the four beasts, every time you see that, in the original Greek, it means the four living creatures, representatives of the angelic host. And the four living creatures had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, talking about their intelligence, their wisdom, their knowledge. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, was in the past, and is, he is in the present, and he is to come. And when those beasts, living creatures, give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders representing the church, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created chapter 5 from verse 9 and he sang a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. And hast made us kings, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Will you be there? I said, will you be there? We shall reign on the earth. And then he tells us, as it goes on there, in verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast, that is the living creatures, and the elders representing the church, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them had I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever and the four beasts said amen and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. It's going to be a great crowd that day. A great innumerable crowd and they will be praising the Lord on that bright and glorious morning when the Son of Man shall come and the radiance of his glory we shall see when from every clime and nation he shall call his people home. What a gathering of the ransom that will be when the blessed who sleep in Jesus at his bidding shall rise from the silence of the grave and from the sea and with bodies all celestial they shall meet him in the skies what a gathering and rejoicing there will be when our eyes behold that city with his many mansions bright and its river calm and restful flowing free when the friends that death has parted shall in bliss again unite what a gathering and a greeting there will be oh the king is surely coming and the time is drawing near when the blessed day of promise we shall see then the changing in a moment in a twinkling of an eye and forever in the presence of the Lord we shall be what a gathering what a gathering what a gathering of the ransom in the summer land of love what a gathering what a gathering of the ransom in that happy home above I will be there I must be there Nothing will hinder me when that great gathering come together and they are praising the Lord and worshiping the Lord by his grace, in his strength, by steadfastness and perseverance and faith in the Lord. I will be there and you will be there in Jesus' name. 
I come to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at the readiness for the marriage supper. The readiness for the marriage supper. We're looking at Revelation chapter 19 verse 7. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. His wife has made herself ready. The readiness for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb is come. That's what the word declares. And his wife has made herself ready. Christ, the Lamb of God, is the bridegroom. I want to remind you, those of us who already know it in the scriptures, that Jesus is referred to as a bridegroom. And the church, those who are born again, those who are children of God, they are referred to as the bride. And as you look at the word of God, you will see that Jesus Christ himself referred to himself as the bridegroom. Look at Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. This is the place where the Pharisees came to accuse the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ that they were not fasting as they were fasting. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14, then came to him the disciples of John saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast out and the disciples fast not? And Jesus says unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. Then shall they fast, referring to himself as the bridegroom. That while he was with them, they couldn't be fasting. He was solving their problems for them. He was moving their mountains. He was healing the sick. He was casting out devils. He was raising the dead. And there was no problem. There was no, no reason for them to fast. But when the bridegroom shall be taken away, and then they will be alone by themselves. That's when they will fast in those days. In John chapter 3 verse 27. John chapter 3 verse 27. John answered and said. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said. I am not the Christ. But that I am sent before him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. John the beloved was saying, I am not the bridegroom, neither am I even the bride. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. The church is the bride, the bridegroom is Christ. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's John. The friend of the bridegroom, that's John, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He, the bridegroom, must increase. I, the friend of the bridegroom, must decrease. And as uh, Paul the Apostle, led by the Spirit of God, was talking about the church. He referred to the church as the bride of Christ. And look at Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Husbands, love your wives. He's talking about husband and then wife. As Christ loved the church. He's talking about Christ and church. Husband, related to Christ. Wife related to the church. That means the church is a bride, the wife of Christ, the bridegroom. And then he tells us in verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's the bride. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11, reading from verse 2, referring now to the bride. I, now I praise you, brethren. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 2. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
as a chaste virgin to Christ. That means the bride is referred to as a virgin, chaste, pure, righteous, holy. And it says, I presented you to Christ as a virgin to be married unto Christ, who is a bridegroom. And then there's sometimes that some students of the Bible, some believers, they, they ask questions. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, will David, Samuel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and those good, good people in the Old Testament, will they be part of the bride? In short, the children of Israel that were redeemed, will they be part of the bride? The question is no. It's the church of the new covenant, the church of the new testament, the church purchased by the blood of the lamb. Those are the people that form the bride. But you say, didn't God say Israel is a wife unto their creator? Let me read it to you in Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. I'm reading to you from verse 5. Isaiah 54 verse 5 For thy maker is thine husband The Lord of hosts is his name Thy redeemer, the holy one of Israel The God of the whole earth shall he be called That's Israel Referred to as the wife of Jehovah Why do you then say They are not part of the bride of the Lamb? Oh, because Israel went away from the Lord and when Israel backs lead from the Lord, it's like a wife that left the husband. A wife that separated from the husband and went to marry another. That's like, um, that's like an, an unfaithful wife. But eventually, you know that the word of God says, the children of Israel, they be reunited again. They will come back again in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. In verse 26, Romans 11, verse 26. So, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a de deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That means the children of Israel, as a nation, they'll come back to God. Remember, first they were married to God. Then they went away from the Lord. And then they will be restored again. Then you see, if they are restored again, are they not part of the bride? No, you cannot call a, a woman who left the husband and went to mess up with another man and eventually came back to the husband. You can't call her a virgin. You see, the bride of Christ will be a virgin. They have come to know the Lord. They stay with the Lord. They remain with the Lord. And then, when the Lord will come, and the marriage supper of the Lamb is taking place, the bride, the virgin, who has not left the Lord into idolatry, like Israel, those are the people that are referred to as the bride of the Lamb. Let's look at the word of God now. We we'll read some of them. We're going to read them again. And then you will see what the Lord is saying. In 2 Corinthians, once again, I'm reading chapter 11, verse 2 for emphasis. 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Ah, jealousy. What kind of jealousy is this? I'm jealous over you. You, under, you should understand this is not talking of sinful jealousy this is talking about a virgin that is to be married to Christ and Paul the apostle ambassador of Christ is watching over them don't go into idolatry and don't go into sin watching over them jealously guarding them protecting preventing that they will not be defiled so they can be new and pure for the coming of the Lord jealous over you with godly jealousy for i have espoused you to one husband that i may present you a chaste virgin to christ in ephesians chapter 5 
Ephesians chapter 5, young converts, this is how we study the Bible. You just go from one part to the other to confirm what we're learning. So open your Bible with me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for each, that he might sanctify and cleanse each or the washing of water by the word. I want you to notice those words when it says, his wife has made herself ready. The way you get ready is you get saved. And then you get sanctified. It says over here that he might cleanse it. He might sanctify it. Wash it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Not an ignominious church, a defiled church, a sinful church, a worldly church, a polluted church, a defiled church, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You see, if you are going to be in a church, stay in a church that will prepare you for the rapture. A church that will prepare you for the coming of the Lord. Not a church where immorality is going on, adultery is going on, and the leader there, the pastor there is divorcing his wife and marrying another person. Not a place where they're using juju and using some water and using the name of Jesus. Not a place where the preacher will come on the pulpit and say, ah, listen everybody. There is no church that is perfect. Here we have our shortcomings on cleanness and whatever, but we are still dancing and praising the Lord. Not a church like that. Jesus is coming for a glorious church. Not having sport, not having wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Thank God I belong to such a church. And I'm not going to exchange belonging to this church with any other sin in my life. This is a church I belong to. And I listen to the preachers in this church. We call them overseers. We call them pastors. We call them coordinators. Every time I listen to them, whether they're teaching Sunday scripture or they're leading in the retreat or any time, when I listen to them, I raise my hand to, I say, I praise God I belong to a church like this. How many of you are praising God you belong to a church like this? Praise the Lord. And I've listened to your pastor. I've listened to some of our leaders who are here. And I'm telling you, if you follow the word we're teaching you, we will take you to heaven. And so that's the kind of church the Lord is preparing. And is preparing us so that by the grace of God, on that day, you will be ready and I will be ready for the coming of the Lord. It tells us in Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13 and i'm reading from verse 32 mark chapter 13 reading from verse 32 the lord is telling us if we're going to be ready we need to watch and we need to pray but of that day and that hour knoweth no man no not the angels which are in heaven neither the son but the father take ye heed that means be careful that means be vigilant that means watch over yourself. Take ye eat, watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or at midnight or at cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. The Lord wants us to watch. I will keep on watching. Everybody say, I'll be watching. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, the Lord is still impressing it upon us that because he is coming, and he's coming not for a defiled lady, but he's coming for a righteous, pure virgin. 
That's the reason we need to watch that impurity, iniquity, sin will not get back into our lives. In Luke chapter 12 verse 31, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We shall have the kingdom. We shall be there in Jesus' name. In verse 35, let your lights be guarded about. Let your lights be born in. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. When, uh, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Have you ever sat on the table sometimes to go to the house of somebody who is highly exalted, highly placed, and then his messengers come to serve you or his wife comes to serve you? The Lord is saying on that day, he himself, he will come to serve you. What a glorious day, what a great gathering. I pray that you will be there. And if we are going to be there, the Lord is saying, watch in Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And take it to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with sofiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. So that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth, of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore. And pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all the sin that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Are there sons of God there? I said, are you the sons of God? Now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. How do we make sure that we're ready? Verse 3. And every man that has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. You see, Revelation chapter 19 where we're studying, it talks about this bride of the Lamb. Verse 7. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready how do you get yourself ready number one be converted that's what gets us ready that's a very starting point of getting on the road to be ready converted number two clean and cleansed you are cleansed you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there is no impurity anymore. Number three, closed. You are closed in the garment of righteousness. Garment of salvation and robe of righteousness. You put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. You put off the old habit and the old clothing. And now you have new clothing upon yourself. You are closed. Number four, you are consecrated. Have you seen how a virgin getting ready to be joined to the husband, the bridegroom, how she keeps herself, 
And when some men want to, you know, fool around with her, she says, no, I'm waiting for my bridegroom. Have you not seen my card? I'm no more a free lady that, you know, anybody can point to, anybody can touch. I am now a person that is consecrated and committed to one man, a person or the church that is getting ready for the rapture, getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb, converted, cleansed and clean, clothed in the robe of righteousness and the garment of salvation, consecrated to the Lord. Number five, cleaving to the Lord. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and he will cleave unto the wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And as you are preparing that you will be part of the lamb, part of the bride of the lamb, you need to cleave to the Lord, join to the Lord, that nothing will separate you. Number six, courageous. You know, the devil will come with temptation, the courage to say no. The courage to be true to what you know, when you ought to say no, that you don't say yes. And when you ought to say yes to the Lord, when he calls you to sacrifice and to submit yourself and to say this is the way walk ye therein the courage to say yes to God and no to the devil and then number seven covenant keeping marriage is about covenant and when you want to be with the Lord in the marriage supper of the Lamb as the bride of Christ you must understand there's a covenant between the bridegroom and the bride and you want to be a covenant keeper I pray the Lord will help you and you will be there on that final day in Jesus name how will that be? How would you be ready? Well, we need the righteousness of the multitude of saints. The righteousness of the multitude of saints. That's why our prayer is, Lord, just to be more like the master. More like the master I would ever be. More of his meekness, more of his humility. More zeal to labor, more courage to be true more consecration for work he beats me to do more like the master is my daily prayer if you want to make it at the rapture and if you want to be part of the bride of the lamb more like the master is my daily prayer more strength to carry crosses i must bear more earnest effort to bring his kingdom in more of his spirit to the wanderer to win more like the master I would live and grow more of his love to others I would show more self-denial like his in Galilee more like the master I long to ever be take thou my heart I would be thine alone take thou my heart and make it all thine own purge me from sin oh Lord I now implore, I now plead, I now pray, I now beg. Wash me and keep me thine forevermore. May the Lord do that for every one of us in Jesus' name. The righteousness of the multitude of saints. The righteousness of multitudes of saints. We're looking at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading to you from verse 8. And to I was granted... That she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And it says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says unto me, These are the true saints of God. Here he talks about the righteousness of the saints. Not the righteousness of the sinners. Not the righteousness of the hypocrites. There's a kind of a righteousness that some people that they are demonstrating all about. You know, they are walking gently and they're looking down. And they say, I don't look at the faces of women. Have you been born again? I don't know what you mean by being born again, but what I know is that I don't smoke, I don't drink. 
Have you received Jesus as your personal savior? I don't know about that. What I know is that when I am walking, if I see an ant on the ground, I will not step on the ant. And I am righteous. And when I see beggars on the road, you know what I do? I put my, 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 my hand in my pocket. I give them money. I am righteous. You know that kind of righteousness? That's exactly the righteousness of the Pharisees. Look at Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, the Lord is telling us that the righteousness of the Pharisees, I fast twice in the week, I go to church every Sunday, I give money to the beggars, and I do my very best. I don't step on the ant, I don't do anything that is wrong to anybody. Here is how my heart is. I never say anybody should not do well. That will not do. Ye must be born again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. You need a kind of righteousness greater, higher than the kind of righteousness you are trying to produce by your self effort. In Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23. Let's see these the Pharisees and scribes. Verse 28. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You see that kind of righteousness, which is only superficial on the outside. When you see your pastor coming, then you'll say, okay, don't continue discussion now. When he, after he has gone, I will, I will discuss it. And you're only living by the fear of man. When you do something, you're saying, I hope they didn't know it was me that did that. When you change the account, I hope they, they don't recognize it was me that do that. And you carry Bible about and you say that you're a member of the church. That kind of righteousness will not do. That's outward. That's superficial. That's to impress men. And that doesn't impress God. Do you know the things that impress men don't actually impress God? Because he knows your heart. And if he knows that your heart is not right with him, whatever you are trying to do to whitewash yourself on the outside, it will not do. Luke chapter 16 verse 15. In Luke chapter 16 verse 15, And he said unto them, Ye are they would justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The kind of righteousness that the Lord is talking about when it says that it was granted unto her. That they should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's the righteousness we get from the Lord. That the Lord himself imparts unto us. That he gives unto us by faith. You come to the Lord and you believe on the Lord. And when you believe on the Lord, he takes your sin away. And he gives you his own righteousness. Romans chapter 4 verse 3. In Romans chapter 4, we're looking at verse 3. For what says the scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's what he gives us himself in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10. Isaiah chapter 61 I'm reading to you from verse 10 it says I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness you see that's coming from the Lord himself he gives us salvation, the garment of salvation, and he gives us righteousness, the robe of righteousness. I told you, and I'm sure you got here, that he makes an exchange. He makes a transfer. You give your sin to him. 
he gives you his righteousness in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 for he has made him to be seen for us that word sin there means sin offering he made him to be our substitute he made him to be our sin our sin carrier that is he took our sin away our offering our sacrifice sin carrier sin bearer substitute for he has made him to be sin offering for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him that's the exchange when you came to the lord what you did you heard it on the crusade field that you will confess your sin and you will throw out your sin and then you will draw in his righteousness he makes an exchange that's the righteousness we're talking about and he clothes us with righteousness in romans chapter 4 romans chapter 4 reading from verse 6 even as david also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputes righteousness without works he gives us the righteousness and it's not something we work for it is something that christ has provided on the cross of calvary saying blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven whose sins are covered blessed is the man to whom the lord will not impute iniquity verse 22 therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up jesus our lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification that's what he does for us he gives us the righteousness and it's number one a present righteousness number two it's a practical righteousness and number three it's a penetrating righteousness it's a kind of righteousness that penetrates into your heart it's not something that is lying on the surface like oil lies on the surface of the water it is present it's for today it is practical it is real and it is penetrating it gets into your heart and out of your heart that righteousness it can be seen it's reaching out from within and it shows in your life and it's number four permanent it's not something we'll put on on sunday and we'll put off on monday and then we live like the devil during the week because the weekdays are weak days the weekdays w-e-e-k a week days w-e-a-k there are some people that make the days of the week to be the time they are weak no strength no righteousness no purity no holiness no when the righteousness of christ comes to you is for the present hour and it is practical and it is penetrating and it is permanent Luke chapter 1 in Luke chapter 1 it tells us what he does for us what he does in us in verse 74 verse 75 that he will grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him how long all the days of our lives he will do it for you he will accomplish it in you you will never be the same again in jesus name the people who are to be who are to be there on that wonderful day that glorious gathering what has happened to them number one they may reconciled reconciled unto the lord 
you gave the Lord your hand. He took your hand. He has linked you with the almighty God. Now you are a child of God. Reconciled. Number two, restored and restoring. You are restored into fellowship with the Lord. And you are restored into union with the Lord. You are restored into the home, into the family of God. And you are restoring. You have stolen anything before you restore. You are restoring. You are restoring your relationship with other people. You have been fighting with somebody. Then you are restoring. Did you hear the testimony during that crusade we just finished yesterday? 17 year old enmity hatred separation between two relatives they came to the crusade and the lord touched their lives and restored them into fellowship with the lord and they became restored to one another 17 year old enmity forgiven and cancelled restored and restoring number three righteous if we are going to be part of that marriage supper of the lamb as part of the bride of the lamb we will be righteous number four renewed he renews your heart and he renews your mind and you have the mind of christ you are renewed number five resting now you rest in the grace of god no more anxiety and no more worry no more fear of the devil no more fear of demons you have come into his bosom to rest come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest and you come to the lord he gives you the rest and he says take my, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for i am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light number six rapturable rapturable before you sleep every night you check up should the rapture take place in the night before i wake up in the morning am i rapturable is there anger hatred search covetousness in my heart am i sleeping tonight with something that may hinder me from making the rapture should the rapture take place in the night before you sleep you check up every time am i rapturable number seven rewarded when we get eventually there and the lord will begin to serve his own and we sit on the table with the almighty god and the angels and the lord jesus christ at the head of the table the bridegroom and he looks all over and he sees the bride and then he looks at you and he said you made it you've come back home joy forevermore happiness forevermore celebration forevermore singing forevermore hallelujah forevermore and thank god i will be there i will be there because i am reconciled with him because i am restored unto him because i have restored the things that i have taken from other people because by his grace i am righteous because i am renewed because i am resting no worry no anxiety because i live a life that is rapturable and because i'm expecting on that wonderful glorious day i will receive a reward stand up and tell the lord you want to be part of those people part of the people of god saved separated sanctified set apart for the glory of the lord and you want to live the life that anytime the lord will come you want to be found rapturable call upon the lord with all your heart and say lord i thank you for the marriage supper of the lamb and i want to be there and i will be there nothing will hinder me tell the lord open your mouth and pray you've come to know the lord then you make sure that you cement your relationship with the lord 
affirm and reconfirm your relationship with the Lord. You have decided you are not going back. You have decided to give your life to the Lord and you are not looking back. And you are not going to allow anything, anything on earth, anything of the flesh, anything of the world to hinder you. You want to remain rapturable, rapturable, rapturable. No evil in the heart, no sin in the heart, no immorality hidden somewhere, no stealing hidden somewhere. No guilt, condemnation hidden somewhere, rapturable. Every day and every moment, you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, keep me ready. Lord, keep me ready. Lord, keep me ready. And let the righteousness, the righteousness of the saints, let it remain in you. Because he has given us salvation. And he has cleansed us. And he has purged us. And has given us his righteousness. And he wants us to keep that righteousness until he will come. You are reconciled with God. There is no barrier anymore between you and the almighty God. You have been restored back into fellowship. And you are restoring. If you have taken the honor of other people, you restore it to them. If you take the glory of God, you restore that glory back to God. If you've taken the money of other people, you restore that money to them. If you've taken the wife of other people, you restore that wife to them. If you've taken the husband of anybody, you restore that husband to them. Restored and restoring. And then righteous. And he puts his righteousness on you. Present righteousness. Practical righteousness. Penetrating righteousness. Perfect as well as permanent righteousness. Renewed. You are renewed in the inner man. You are not thinking the way you used to think. You are not talking the way you used to talk. You are not behaving the way you used to behave. You are renewed, renewed in your mind, renewed in your heart, renewed in your behavior. Resting. No worry, no anxiety, no panic. Resting. You have come to rest on the bosom of Christ. Rapturable. Rapturable. Rapturable and rewardable. Rapturable, the Lord will come. Rapturable. I want to make sure that before you sleep every night, you're asking yourself, should the Lord come tonight? And should the rapture take place before the morning hour? Where would I be? Rapturable. And the things I do now, on that final day, when God shall examine the motive for what I do and the manner in which I do it and the method I use in doing it is what I am doing rewardable. Pray, tell the Lord to make you ready for that day.